Yo, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to this week's latest episode of Can I Kick It FC? It is your host, as always, Yogi. I'm back in the studio with a couple of my cool friends. And I think we have probably the most domino effect this story in European history. We're going to phase it that way. Um, so we're going to talk about a team that probably impacted the culture before we even knew what the culture of soccer was. We're talking about Louis Van Hall's IX team. We're talking about how great it was, some of the stuff behind the scenes you didn't know. Also, we're going to mention a little bit of what could have happened in the course of soccer history and why Shanir might cry because there is a world in which Dennis Bergkamp ends up somewhere else besides Arsenal. And... And where Van der Sar doesn't end up in Man United, it's all crazy off the season. Um, it's Monday night, and I'm tired. So this podcast might get moody. <laughs> but I say all that to say, introduce my co-host starting over here by my side. is Mr. Jermaine Scott. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Glad to be back. Uh, shout out to y'all for holding it down. Last episode, brilliant episode, and crazy episode considering the departure of Ernie Stewart. But... That was that was last episode, so let's stick on this episode. But uh, yeah, very happy to be back. Yeah, nice to have you back, man. You know, pleasure. You know, we had to do all the heavy lifting when you were gone. Uh. <laughs> uh, for those who don't know, our last episode was on Ernie Stewart, who by the <laughs> way now is out of a job. Well, well, no, he got a job. Is it? Do we call? Do we call this family upwards, or is this like, no, you you deserved it. It's the better it's the better gig right now. Yeah, right. <laughs> probably probably true. Probably true. Probably, true. probably is. Well, probably is. Um next we have, as you heard, her lovely voice. One half of is it one half of Shape Butter FC or one third of Shape Butter FC? Uh it's still half. Okay. All right. Well one half of Shape Butter FC. It's Miss Sills. How are you doing, homie? Um, I'm here. It's busy. Busy times, but I'm I'm here. Glad to be here. What is it not busy times for you? Not nah, an education, not not really oh, at all right now until this break you comes. So, because right now we're going through like uh, end of the semester, so now I have kids coming up to me. It's like, hey, mm-hmm. so you know about that F? We changed yeah. it to an A, and I'm like, no, absolutely not. Like <laughs> at all semester, <laughs> you had time, and right. I had seniors, like literally. Their only senior project for this semester is a five-page paper on a person that changed sports politically. I had one kid come to me yesterday. So about that paper, can I get an extension? Sir, we're in second semester. You don't get my face to stop playing with me? Yeah. <laughs> That's how it goes, though. It annoys me. It annoys me. Um, <laughs> and the guy who just hopped back on screen, um, and also remember, folks, you can donate to... Can I kick it, FC? Uh, link is in the file down below. Uh, with that money, we're going to help Shanir have better internet. <laughs> doing, yeah. I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I'm finally back in. Uh, I just gave up and, and decided to try and use my phone. Hopefully, this does a lot better. <laughs> yeah. So, for people who don't know, the ongoing joke between Can I Kick It and River City 93 is that Shanir internet at some point is going to let him down. It's just a matter of act of win. So, if you want to take yeah. that. Of when it happens again. <laughs> Go free to do that. Living in a stick, man. Gotta send yeah. there. Yes. You live out there in Fallville, sir. Yeah. Yes. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we all, let's, so outside of me, DB, let's go ahead, let's jump into it. Uh, we're talking about this great team here. This IX team, and this is just the highlight of it, the, ni- uh, the 1994-95 season, but I think this team, Jermaine, correct me if I'm wrong, kind of starts is is climb up the hill, 1991, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, Louis Van Hall takes over in '91, um, and we really see uh, you know Louis Van Hall kind of implement his style of total football um, in, into the team, right? And specifically, I think what's what's most interesting about that team is. Um, 
you know the midfield right i think i think in uh, a couple of episodes we were talking about the importance of of black midfielders right and here in this ajax team we have two of the greatest black midfielders um in, in football in history with edgar davids and and clarence sadorf kind of just you know really controlling uh, not just the midfield but but really the team right and so we could talk a little bit more about the, the individual players but um we, yeah we're seeing kind of this this climax of ajax uh throughout the early 90s um with this with this undefeated season uh of the champions league yeah yeah most definitely and i mean scenario you would know the pain of louis van hall ball <laughs> being a manchester united <laughs> fan man but i think yeah this, I, <laughs> I think this is where louis van hall really gets his like his glow up as like I am this technical mastermind because for those who don't know, like Louisville Hall is a product of total football in a sense. But I know there's yes. between him and Cruyff, which I'm interested in slightly enough. Like I'm wondering if Louisville Hall can slug Cruyff or not vice versa. Like who are you taking in that fight? Uh, I'm taking I'm taking Cruyff. Really? I'm taking Cruyff. Cruyff. Look, Cruyff is known for bringing some unexpected stuff to a fight. He will bring some unexpected stuff to any type of competition. He's going to throw a curveball at you at any moment. Van Gogh is quite predictable. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. But but he has a wild side to him, which yeah, I feel like gives does. him that edge. <laughs> it does. And to me just looks like all length and like smoker lungs. And Louis Van Hall looks like he'll like prepare for like 20 hours just to figure out when to perfectly land the right hook. But it's got to be like a precise movement because if not, then he'll get rid of you like Lamar. <laughs> yeah, we'll get that later. I feel proud of that. Though. All right, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Generic here. Louis Van Hall, this IX team set up tactically wise was like Louis Van Hall's baby child. Like you can see how perfect this team fit off all together, but it was a different IRC setup because they got rid Louisville Hall moved away from the 4 3 and moved kind of to like this 3 4 3 dominance. Explain it more because I know you understand. It. Yes. Um, Louis Van Gogh brought something completely different in terms of the lineup. He really threw a curveball, especially when you look in the finals, uh, in the in the Champions League finals where he had basically like a diamond four in the midfield, three up top, three in the back. But the the crazy thing was um, your two outside center backs also almost doubled as outside backs. And it was it was it was kind of weird because when you first look at the formation you're like, "Okay, there's no outside backs. There's no there's no wing backs." Because in this situation, you're looking at a, a, a team where your midfield is Rijkaard, Zaydorf, uh, De Boer, and Davids. None of them are wingers. None of them are fullbacks. And your back three of uh, Reisiger, Blind, and Frank De Boer, they're all kind of center back, central defender players. So De Boer and Reis uh Reisiger, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but um, uh, yeah, uh, De Boer and Reisinger, they kind of doubled as fullbacks, and which allowed the concentration of the possession and the concentration of the ball movement to be between those four in the midfield, uh, De Boer, Davids, Zaydorf, and Reichardt. So it, it was it was very different, and I mean, it was tough to cope with. It was really, really tough to cope with. Yeah, yeah. Hey. Are you about to say something, man? Oh no, I'm just, I'm just really admiring this picture. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dope picture. It's a dope. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna ask you this: like, <clears throat> obviously, we see Louis Van Hall, very young, looking very dapper and dapper. I'm pretty sure somewhere in their photo, that's a cigarette. It's bound to happen. It's early nineties. Either and, that or a glass of wine. Probably yeah. so. If we look at Louis Van Hall in this premise of what we know him as now is this very um, prudent, very strict tactical manager, this guy that uh, was very bullish towards the media. How how do people look at him in the beginning years of 
in the 1991 because if you like if you read some of the stuff back then it was kind of like hey who is this guy why are we hiring an assistant he doesn't have any managerial experience like how did he go from that point to leading arguably the greatest IX team since course IX? what's the question what's the question well, of that? I don't know Okay. <laughs> yeah. well, basically <laughs> basically the question is how did Louis Van Hall make this team work well I mean I, well um, I, I think one of the biggest things with IX that is that has always been very different from other big clubs other Champions League winning clubs is the ingrown talent and the youth development. I mean, over the years, Ajax, even to this day, Ajax is just churning out talent. It's just like a talent mill where players are coming out of that academy. The only academy in Europe that is considered maybe at this point to, to maybe be better than Ajax's academy is Clairefontaine in France, where your Thierry Henry, Paul Pogba, and Golo Kante came out of. And, mm -hmm. and, and you know, the Nicolas and Elka. So you're looking at a, a, a situation where they are always going to be willing to take a chance on a manager because they know they have that talent coming through. They know they have that academy that is going to just churn out talent. I I agree, and I think sometimes it's almost easier to take a risk on a young manager when you have that academy structure, um, and I think that's what they did. And it's while he didn't have any managerial experience, right? He had a good idea of how tactically total football worked, and I wanted to stay in that same vein. And so the learning curve was there, but it probably wouldn't wasn't as steep as somebody else's learning curve would have been surprisingly um and with that setup he could make mistakes and and figure it out as he as he went and the expectations weren't high either right like exceeding expectations wouldn't have been as hard for him though again clearly at the beginning it was pretty rough um and people had a lot of gripes but i think when you hire somebody like that like it gives you a couple of seasons to really get it right um and that's what he got and it worked out yeah no it really didn't seem like he got it worked out um 91 season man uh, you go look at that roster you kind of see some of the the greats of like soccer as we know now like Dennis Burkham for instance was on the team he got it started that 91 team um and then what I think 92 no, my fault. 91 was his breakout year. He did six goals in all competitions and whatnot. Leading into the 92 year, it's kind of like, you know, this is Louisville Hall's second year. We win the KMB Cup. But you lose Dennis Bergkamp and Juan Jump to enter. But in return, you get Frank Reichard, Friend George, and uh, Harry Litton. Like, that, that's, a, that's a good trade off, right? Yeah. Absolutely, and, and 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 keep in mind that uh, Rijkaard is coming from Milan, right? Who just is tearing it up in Europe, right? During the late '80s, early '90s, so he's coming back to Ajax. He's coming back home as kind of this veteran, right? To help to help lead the team, and so I think it I think it kind of speaks to you know Van Hall's kind of um, uh, uh, kind of tactics, right? I mean, not tactics, but like the like how he thought about his team, right? He understood that. This was a young core group of players, right? Kind of like this new generation of, of Dutch players. Um, but it also had to be balanced, right? With kind of these, this veteran leadership uh, that Rijkaard uh, provided. Yeah. I mean, I think I saw the stat. I think the over, kind of fast forward, but that Champions League winning team, I think the overall age of that team was, I think like 24. And I yeah. think the only two old people on the field, excuse me, say, oh, can I? I am not officially old. I feel it every day I wake up. Um, but the only two veteran players on that team were Frank Reichardt and uh, Blinn. That was it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And that's 
that's incredibly hard to hit and believe, man. You know? Yeah, if you if you look at like Sedorf, I think he's like 19, 18, yeah. right? Starting, right? Uh David is like 21. Yeah. Right. So it's it's a young group of yeah, it's definitely a young group of players. And I think that adds to the excitement about the team, right? It's a, a youthful, energetic group, right? They're out there to get it. Um and I think it I mean, we see this kind of undefeated season, right? Uh in ninety five, both in the domestic league and in the Champions League. All right. So I want to pause right here and ask you guys this question. It can be open up to anyone, but with this young black core at IX, and we're talking prior to the win of the Champions, I don't, don't get to that point yet, but this young core team is coming together, but there's a lot of black talent in this team as well. Like, how do you think the the city, like IX itself, and also the kind of like Netherlands were kind of looking at this team and like, you know, were they excited about them? Were there like reservations? You know, how, how was the temperament around this team? Um, well, I think that around this team, there was a lot of anticipation because I think like we were talking about, we talked about this 90-45 season uh, where Champions League, you're looking at, that's, that's the, that's the, the, the peak of that that era that era under Louis van Gaal that era of of Ajax where where you know you have Dennis Bergkamp and Dennis Bergkamp eventually uh is is leaves and you have this uh, Ajax for the past three four years is on a steady incline until you've reached this 94 95 season where they they literally take the world by storm so i think when we're getting up to there there is this sense of addition, this sense of okay what is this team gonna pull off this year because last year was insane last year was crazy um you do still have like we talked about before uh on the side a lot of the uh a lot of the uh the racial issues that were going on with regards to the players on the team and feeling unfairly treated and and and, and things of that nature um, but there's one thing that I noticed that really doesn't change much. This notion of, oh, well, let's just play football, you know? And at the end of the day, you're, you're, you're looking at a situation where the success kind of overshadowed the struggles a bit. And so the struggles became personal. For this became more of a personal thing than more of a let's put this out there to the world because at the end of the day regardless of how well un unless it's extreme uh, most of the times regardless of how much you feel that you're being mistreated who wants to ruin a good thing you're winning games left and right you're dominating you're dominating netherlands um and and you have one of the greatest academies in the world um, so even though, and, and I think it's the reason why a lot of those players after this season, they're like, all right, we got our success. We had a great season, but I still don't like what's going on here. So I'm going to check out and go somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, like in the early nineties, uh, a lot of the Dutch media, it was weird, right? Like the Dutch media is is racist in a lot of different ways right? <laughs> so on, the one, on the one hand they're like you know wow like the success of the ajax and the dutch is, is really being energized by this youthful you know young black group of, of players right and then all of a sudden they quickly go into and these black players come from Suriname, which was a colony uh, of the of the Netherlands, and uh, you know they are descendants of slaves, and so it just goes into like this really weird, uh, <laughs> like anthropological <laughs> discourse uh, about like where these people come from, uh, and then and then like in the like nineteen ninety four, nineteen ninety five, they start having like these uh, these studies basically <laughs> about why these black players are so good <laughs> like yo how wh why, why why are these black players balling out right now and some of the studies is just wild um they literally 
go back to like racial science right like yo like black people actually have faster twitch muscles and from the days of slavery they were they you know achieved this great strength that is now that they are now able to use in the contemporary period right and it's like really like this is like what's being discussed in like dutch newspapers during this time um so it's 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 quite um it's quite it's quite disturbing right but similar to the contemporary moment right this obviously that racial science piece is is still there but it's not as overt right but what is similar to the contemporary moment is of course when they're playing well right they're getting the praise but then when they're missing penalties and they're and they're and they're not playing well that's when they get the criticism right and so that and like and by criticism i mean like racism right? like straight up like yo what are y'all doing yeah. y'all, like y'all not using your heads yeah. to play the game right like that that type of racial mm-hmm. discourse so it's 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 really yeah, it's, a it's the bag. two extremes. Yeah, yeah. 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 It kind of goes like yeah. Oh, what you want to say, Sam? About that? No, I was gonna say you saying that it just brings us back to the 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 Euros two years ago or last year. Oh my gosh, COVID messed things up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, the the Euros mm-hmm. the, uh, where everyone's it, for for years on end for years ever since he came out strangely under louis van gaal marcus rashford is is lorded as a young talent that's coming up and whatever and if for, mm. for year after year after year he's considered one of the great uh uh bakayo saka and then all of a sudden they miss their pks in the in the finals of the euros and all of a sudden they're hated on they're completely demolished there is a side of that that is just a european soccer fan thing because we think about what happened to david beckham when he got that red card in 98 like they were literally burning effigies of him in the streets like it it was insane but this situation it 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 magnifies even more because they're in, inserting the race issue into it and you're looking at this soccer passion that, okay yes we get it you know one day a soccer player is an absolute hero the next day he makes one slight mistake on the field and he's the complete villain that's that's normal that happens in in with the passion of sports but the insertion of race every time a black soccer player has a misstep on the field or has a misstep off the field it's just Mm -hmm. it's a stark stark difference Mm -hmm. and you saw that with this team you saw that with this team thankfully in this year you don't see it much because i mean i i think we'll well i guess we'll we'll talk about that calendar year and how outrageously amazing that was but they thankfully that year they didn't get as much of the criticism but again like you were saying like the the the, the race science articles and stuff about that it's like why do we have to even talk about this why why is this even you know a thing <laughs> absolutely right um let's go ahead let's talk about the team man this is the team that i think captured so many people's attention just because one correct me if i'm wrong but i think this is probably the blackest team to win the champions league like when you I, that, I think so my yeah. Answer, yeah. This, yeah i'm struggling to think of a team that's probably blacker no like and this like, might have been and like blackity black, black. black. <laughs> yeah, yeah i'm like no i can't think of one no, and and I think the re- one of the reasons why is because after this era, when you go into and especially around the era right after the '98 World Cup, you have a big international mixing of soccer players on different mm. top level teams. So, like you've got like you look at Tottenham, they've got players from Asia, from Africa, from South America, from North America, from from Europe, and now and you look at this this team, they're basically all Dutch except for two Nigerians and a Finnish player. Mm. Uh, all of them are are Dutch. Yes, there's Suriname. There's 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 um, oh, what are, what other countries were there? Um, there's Suriname. There's, um, <laughs> there's Congo, yeah, yeah. There, there's Congo. There's but, uh, but dual citizenship. They are Dutch players, 
So <laughs> you're you're looking at a situation now where you, you've got an influx of players from South America. There's and then it, later on, I think you need to start getting into the late. 2000s to start seeing more Asian players, more Middle Eastern players coming into international soccer, European soccer. But you're, I don't know if we're going to be able to get another team like this, especially not on the club level. On the international level, you said what? You said the rate Chelsea's going, it might happen. They might buy up all of Africa and be like, one of y'all can win a Champions League. Go out there and do it. Absolutely, oh, man. Uh, yeah, no, they're, they're, not, they're just literally like <laughs> <laughs> they're throwing darts at a map. Yeah. Chelsea's literally just throwing darts at a map. You're not... <laughs> hey, hey, your man said, listen, if I'm gonna get this penalty, I'm gonna have a loaded squad before I get it. Right, right. Um, <laughs> talking about loaded squads, man. This IX team, Shanae, you brought up the point, man. This IX team, outside of three players, all was from the Netherlands, and I think. A cool, uh, not a cool way, but I think the way how you need to look at this team, man, this is literally the last great European team to be heavily featured of the country that they're in. Um, because that summer '95, we get the Bosman rule, right? right? So right. when you go look at international rosters prior to the Bosman rule, more than eighty percent of that team is made up of that country. Right, because there's no, there's no free agency. There's no movement amongst players. If you wanted to move, it was pretty much like, all right, we might sell you for some cash, but we getting something in return. Um, it, yeah. it wasn't like, as if you were free. You know, I mean, say if you ran a contract with the team, you could then test the water to see like, oh, hey, can I get this contract, get this contract. It was pretty much, no, we still hold your rights. And if we're cool with this team paying you, then what's up? If not, we'll just hold you in purgatory. Yeah. Um, so this Bosman ruling, like we saw it, I mean, granted, they said together one more year, but it, you can kind of see this was the last team to, to you know, be the host country. Like, I think of, what, the great Celtic team that won the Champions League, the great uh, Milan teams, um, shoot, the Benfica teams that were, like, heavily Portuguese. Like, how important was that to have pretty much like 95 percent of the team to be from the netherlands that was a question but you know we'll move oh, on. no no it was not but it, i mean it was mad important right i mean yeah. it was mad important right that you know and i think it was more important uh not just for the club side but for the national side right where you have all of the all of the national team players playing not all of them but the majority of them playing on the same team right playing in the mm -hmm. in the domestic leagues yeah. right so they're familiar with the system right obviously there's a relationship between the ix style and and the and the national team style in terms of this total football philosophy so um it's, it's incredibly important right but but that bosman ruling changed the game right and i think i think davids was the first one to take advantage of the bosman ruling once it once it was passed, right? He was like, "Yo, I'm out. I, I'm I'm done with this." <laughs> and he, he moved on to uh, bigger and better things. But the right. fact that they were all together on the same team absolutely was definitely built the chemistry and and you know help help secure kind of the success that they experienced. Well, yeah. Let's let's look at the '94 team success, um, and then we'll come back to the Bosman rule and everything like that. So, fun fact about this team: if you ever want to win a, a history quiz or anything. He, they, are, they are the only team to win a Champions League going undefeated in their domestic season. Team played 34 games, won 27, drew 7. I want to ask you guys this question, if anyone knows. Do you know how many goals they scored in the end of season that year? Without Wikipedia. Don't use Wikipedia. I don't. Yeah, I can't tell you. Um, uh, what was, how many games they played 34? I think, I think, domestic? How many? Oh... Uh, Domestic I think it was, it was over a hundred. It's got to be over a hundred. It was over a hundred. It was the yeah. Precise number. I don't oh, know. One thirty-four. Trying to remember. Oh no, it's not that high. It would be crazy. It's not. It's not that high. It was. It was. It was. It was like just above a hundred. It was like one hundred five or something. All right. I was gonna say one hundred four. One hundred six. Oh wow. <laughs> Goals, That's crazy. Only let in 28. And we're talking about a defense of 
Frank DeBoer, uh, Blinn, White Card, and the other center back is not escaping my mind right now. Oh, God. He's going to kill me. But yeah, that whole defense only led 28 goals the entire time. Uh, it was uh, Ray Zinker. There we go, Ray Zinker. Yeah. Or at, le- at, le- at least he was at least he was the one in, in, in that Champions League final game. Um, but uh, throughout the season, I guess, you know, of course, it's dropping and changing. You can't play every single game. <laughs> yes. Yeah, speaking of that, shout out to Winston Bogart, uh, who was also on that back line sometimes, kind of interchanging in and out. Uh, mm-hmm. a very dope player, another very outspoken player <laughs> in terms of the injustices that they experience uh, oh, at IX. Yeah, we'll kind of speed through this part because we need to talk about some of these injustices, man. But the only game they lost that year was in the KMVB Cup. It was a quarterfinal game against Fire Nord. Um, the team won the Dutch Super Cup against Fire Nord, oddly enough. Champions League group, they played Ajax, they played Milan, uh, Casino Salzburg, who never heard of that team before, but the fact they got Casino in the name sounds pretty cool to me. And then AEP Athens. Dominated that group, finished top of the group. Oh, guys, this is another thing. I want to ask you guys this question real quick. How much? How many points did you get for a win back in the day? Two. I want you to know how badly my head was hurting when I was looking at these group stages. I was like, they have 10 points, but they have four wins. And four <laughs> wins doesn't equal 10 points. Yeah. This doesn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> in like a good 30 minutes, I'm sitting here like really trying to do math and like this doesn't make sense. And then I realized like, oh no, they were two points. Game is changed, yeah. right? Yeah. Where? Right. Learn something new every day. Yeah. Um but on the run to the Champions League, they uh play Hottage Split. Beat Bayern Munich, and I think if this result happened in today's world, matter of fact, it did happen. When y'all guys remember when I beat Real Madrid, and we were all like, "Oh, this team is good." <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They beat Bayern Munich yeah, I... five to two in Netherlands, and that's insane to me. But yeah, what were you gonna yeah, say? Uh, the... I, I, I was gonna say, Ajax uh, is is always in the conversation yeah um they're they're always in the conversation in the champions league even if they're having a down year you know they're gonna make it nine times out of ten they're making it pack past the group stage uh every once in a while they'll they'll end up third and they'll drop into the europa league but that the there is a, a a consistency with ajax and i think when you look at this team and what this team did, it's kind of that benchmark. Because you, you if you look, for example, let's look at American uh, sports and let's look at school sports. Right. You're like how a, a, a school ends up being a staple in maybe the NCAA. Uh, uh, in NCAA is not because oh they just have a good because you gotta think about it a player is not going to be playing there for more than four years after four years they've graduated bye bye gone that's it but they keep churning out if you look for example the yukon women's basketball team right. it's like every year it's like who's gonna come in second because we know yukon's gonna win so <laughs> so you 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 have this situation where they had been something so big that now everyone is like that's the place to go that's the place to go that's the place to put my kids that's the academy to put my Mm -hmm. kids in to for 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 my kids to to train in and that's when you have this talent continuing to come out you have your 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 van percy's you have your i mean you you have the second generation of this of this team uh plybert and these these are literally the children of the of the ones that started this and, and it's like no, they're they're going to where it started, and it's just it, it's just one of those things that it feeds itself because of it started here. It the the, the system feeds itself by starting with such a phenomenal year as this that literally turned the eyes of the entire world. 
I want to I want to pivot course real quick, and I want to kind of drive you guys into this conversation because I'm interested here in all your opinions on it. Is it fair to say that this IX team is kind of like the start of, I guess, black soccer, black soccer love in Europe? Almost in the sense of like mm. you have this very recognizable team of black talent, Clar- Clarence Hudo, Frank Reichard, um, Edgar Davis, and whatnot. But it's also like so many of these guys went on to do major things in the European stands that you also have this boom happening of where black fans are starting to like, oh, it's not like I've recognized some of these guys on these great teams, you know. Mm-hmm. There were individual black players that did great things on other teams. But to my regulations, it's kind of like that first team to really be quote unquote all black. What do you guys think? Or your thoughts on it? Yeah, like for me, IX has kind of always been like, oh, this is a team black people root for. Like it just it is, right? And I think that is directly tied to the legacy of of those early mid nineties teams. Like Mm-hmm. They were the one European team that just had a bunch of black dudes on it, right? And they were good. And so, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's coincidence, right? Like, particularly black people of a certain age, like we're all like Ajax fans. Like, mm-hmm. one, they have good kids too, but like, yeah, like I think most most black people of a certain age, particularly like millennials and stuff, Ajax is kind of their team. You know what I mean, like. There are other squads, obviously, but they're the one that I think no matter what, they're like the common denominator. Like, that's the squad. We like how they play. We like what they look like. Um, Yeah, I don't know. That's always the impression that I've got as long as I've watched people. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, like, to Sil's point, right, it's like my, my introduction or my first memory, I should say, of Ajax, but really the Dutch national team is, is the 98 World Cup and just seeing mm-hmm. not just one, but two players with dreadlocks on the team, right? With yeah. Seydorf and and, and, and uh, Davids, right? So it's like, whoa, like, <laughs> like okay. these players are black, but they're like oozing like black culture, right? Like they're I like think every black person on the team had one stereotypical black haircut. Like you have the locks, you had right. some, you had a clobber with the jerry curl. Somebody had a fade. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the phases of black hair. Somebody got everyone had a little bit of something in it. <laughs> yeah, I'm yep. sure the Dutch team, Kobe was the only other person I knew who had like any kind of locks. Who had locks? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he was the only other big name one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and at the same time, right, also going on in Europe, you got. You got Rude Gullet that's going to Chelsea, right? He becomes the Chelsea manager, right? So there's this this really great concentration of like Black Dutch yeah. excellence, if you will, uh, Black Dutch excellence, not only in the in the Netherlands, right, but throughout Europe. Uh, that's really just taking <laughs> taking European football by storm. Mm-hmm. Uh, now that you mention it, now the more that I think about it, you know how now we talk so much about how like France is kind of like the the team of Africa, like it's very easy for black people to root for France because you see the likes of Paul Pablo and Golo Conte, Kylian Mbappe, you know, these black faces that are really representative of the culture and they represent the culture as well. Do you feel as if, and I know we just talked about how black people was kind of looking at his IRC was kind of like their gateway and whatnot, but sometimes I kind of feel like there's this weird pushback with the Dutch that Netherlands team and players accepting that blackness. Like you sometimes you never truly hear them and say like, oh yes, I I'm, I'm Dutch, but my mother's from Suriname or whatever. Like you hear it is from French players or from the English players. And then people can feel connected to them. Why is it like this hesitance or this pushback with black players or black fans and the Dutch national team? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think it started there, uh, uh, and I, I think you're looking at a situation where there's this sense of, oh, you, you're you, you should be a patriot. You should, you know, you shouldn't be saying that. You know, you're Dutch, and and you need to represent as as Dutch. And it's it's basically that decade's version of criticizing the kneeling for the national anthem. 
basically. So you're, you're looking at a generation, they're like, well, yeah, I have a Dutch passport, but my family is from Suriname or my family is from Curaçao. I mean, it's, it's interesting because I remember I, I, I did this once because, you know, I'm a soccer nerd. Um, I actually went through a lot of the great players from countries like France, the Netherlands, uh, England, and Germany. And I said, okay, if I were to take all of these players and have them play for the country of their parents' birth, Germany would be crap. France would be crap. Netherlands would be complete crap. England would be complete crap. And it's it's like you, you see this international inflow of the and and of course yes you're looking at it as okay this is basically the immigrants coming in and the second generation immigrants representing that nation mm-hmm. instead of embracing that and em- embracing the fact that oh we have all of these different cultures in our country there's there's uh, this sense of let's subdue that no it, we're, we're france no we're england you're english you, you don't need to talk about where your parents are from you're english when at the end of the day you need to look at it like yeah look at how great our country is everyone wants to come here get how international our team is and i think that's one thing that you see a little bit more for the u.s men's national team than you see for all of these other countries you see the u.s men's national team more so embracing the diversity that they have than these other countries. There's still a long way to go. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I, um, I think I think in terms of the in ter- I mean just looking at a situation where you have so many players. I mean one of the great even though he's persona non grata right now, when you look at some of the players that are awarded Claudio Captain Claudio is obviously not your typical Caucasian with a name like that. <laughs> so, like, so it, there, I, I think with this team, I think this was a good way with the success that they had to force these countries to think about it differently, to force the people to think about, okay, yes, I'm black. Yes, I'm Dutch, but my parents are from another country and I still want to keep that. And I still want to be able to embrace that side of my culture. Yes, I would, I'm putting that orange jersey on when, it, when World Cup time comes around, when World Cup qualifications match come around, when the Euros comes around. But I still have my roots. I still have my ancestry that I want to respect. And with, with the, the, the level that they reached, they're able to convey better. And I think this is why, that's why things have slowly started to change with that. It started with this team. So I, I saw the wheels going yeah. off. Of right now, so I'm gonna give you the floor. I know you guys something great to say. No, I think it's, it's super interesting. I think some of it is, it's Europe. Like it's just, mm-hmm. at the heart of it, football is very much the sport of immigrants, right? Like it is the, sort of unifier if you're coming from one place and going to another it's it's like math and music right like it's this universal language you don't have to speak the same language to be able to play football with somebody we see it all the time um but yeah i think it's it's an identity thing in europe it's really interesting right you've seen that pushback like you said from england right when you had three Mm -hmm. black players miss pks and it very much became this Animus that had way more to do with the just being, oh, you missed, but they were black players that missed. You got that pushback from France, right? You get a lot of like nationalistic pushback even with that team, despite them winning in 2018 and damn near winning in 2022. And their best player being a young 22, 23 year old black, young black man, right? Who is French, unapologetically French, but he's also the son of somebody from. Algeria, right, is essentially, you know, we don't use Berber anymore, but his mom's a Berber, his dad's, you know, from Sub-Saharan Africa. Like, it's really, um, I think Europe struggles with it, in part because 
unlike the U.S. who who needs those players, right? Like we don't. We're working clearly on on growing our domestic talent. That's not to say we've never had great domestic talent. We've had great players, but I think we're a lot more willing to to not compromise, but I think embrace that you know dual national or multinational, what have you, um, team because. We but- them. So if I'm hearing you correctly, is yeah, I think you can. Way? You can also. It- I was saying, I think you can also equate that to the to the immigration era of the United States, like yeah. where literally everyone from Europe was coming to the U.S. It's like, okay, we're a melting pot. Let's just let's just own it. Right, was <laughs> born here on like his parents' vacation or something, and went back to England. Like it's a very finite <laughs> amount of time. So if I'm hearing you right, it's pretty much that places like France, England, U.S. even. We're, they're a little bit more accepting of it. Like, you're allowed to be French, but you're also allowed to be Black. Where the Netherlands is more so like, no, you're Dutch. That's it. You just happen to be Black. Well, yeah, to some extent. I mean, the Dutch okay. have their own very unique history, as do most of those European countries that colonized other people. Um, and I, again, I think it's going to be pushed back no matter what. Also, people don't want to be confronted with the history of their country when it's not great, right? Like, yeah. those faces represent a whole lot of bad things that people did. Because why are they in your country, right? Like, that's, they can't really work one, anywhere else. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like, <laughs> I'm here because you messed up my right. country. <laughs> like, all right, cool. Um, Jermaine, you made an extra point before we started recording, man, about how a lot of this team and a lot of the black talent kind of looked at their paycheck and it was like, you get, it's kind of like that classic meme of you get paid how much? And then mm-hmm. the guy behind him is like, we're getting paid for this? <laughs> <laughs> like, just like, explain that part a little bit more because I think that's a really fascinating part. It kind of encapsulated with the whole Bosman rule thing that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. So, so I want to answer that question, but I also want to hop in on that previous question because oh, yeah, I think there's. <clears throat> me, I think there's a, a number of different levels to this, right? So on the one hand, we can look at fans and and ask, is there a disconnect between fans and the Dutch national team? Is there a disconnect between like fans um, and kind of this black black Dutchness? Um, and if there is, right, we can make the argument whether or not it is or isn't. But if there is a disconnect, I think a, a lot of that comes from the fact that these are Surinamese Dutch players, and Suriname isn't as readily available in our minds as say you know like an african an african nation that was colonized by france or england right so suriname seems a little foreign to us kind of in our in our kind of colonial history right like we don't really talk a lot about i mean just before the episode we're like yo who did, who did the dutch colonize like it, it, it took us a while to like figure that out right so well, i think that's something we just can't figure out who Oh yeah, no, that Dutch West India Company was yeah. very real, <laughs> very yeah. much part of that yeah. uh, slave trade. Um, so there's that level of the, kind of the fan disconnect. I, I will say that the players themselves, they walked a fine line and I think they did a really good job balancing that dual nationality, right? So on the one hand, yes, they played on the Dutch team. They were very open about it. like, yo, we are Dutch. We grew up in, you know, we grew up in the Netherlands. Like we, we know Dutch culture. But on the other hand, there were times, and this is kind of going to your to your second question, uh, uh, Yogi, is that um, at times they, they did, right? Like acknowledge and recognize their allegiance to Suriname, right? Like Patrick Clivert in one interview says like, everyone knows if there was a Surinamese national team, things would be a lot different, right? Like, he says that, right? Like, like the players know, like, they're very much aware of their Surinamese background, and they're trying to balance uh, that dual nationality, right? And and I think the, the struggle of balancing that, which is kind of what we see throughout Europe, is this idea of, like, multiculturalism, right? So the Netherlands is all about... We are a multicultural society, right? Like, like let's all exist as one. The problem with that is that part of multiculturalism is that uh, those other cultures then get absorbed into Dutch culture, right? So it's no longer Surinamese in Dutch culture; it's Surinamese under Dutch, right, under Dutch culture, right? So, so they're so they're trying to figure out how to balance being Dutch also representing Surinamese culture, right? During the '90s 
they actively are generating conversations about Dutch history, right? As Sylv said, no one likes talking about it. Like these European nations are not going to take the initiative to talk about their colonial and slaving past, right? So these players uh, energized that conversation during the 90s, right? Especially when you have moments, and this is and this is to your second question, uh, especially when you have moments where after the Champions League, all of the if if not if I'm not mistaken, I think all of the black Dutch, uh, all of the black Ajax players leaves, right? A large part because of this Bosman ruling, right? There's more freedom to move um, at the end of your contract or what have you. Um, but they also express that they felt undervalued at the club, right? And so um, there was there was a report that came out during this time after after the Champions League. Uh, I'm just trying to pull up the numbers to make sure I don't get it wrong. But they said that uh, people like De Boer and okay, so it says the brothers Ronald and Frank De Boer each received two hundred thousand pounds. This is on uh, the IX uh, salary. Danny Blind received almost as much, while Edgar Davids received only 40,000 pounds. Sado from Clyber collected 32,000 pounds, and Reisiger uh, uh, received 26,000 pounds, right? And so <laughs> it's a huge pay gap, right? They are literally the core of the team. And after the Champions League, they start getting all these different offers from, you know, from Milan, from Juventus, from Sampdoria, like millions of dollar contracts, right? Like million dollar contracts. And so there, there, there's this open discussion, this public discussion about all of these black players. Like, yo, we're out, we're leaving. Y'all don't, y'all don't value us as, and they, and they make it very explicit. We feel like y'all are not valuing us because of our Surinamese identity, right? Because of our Surinamese background. They're very explicit about it, right? And so they just did, right? And so that's just like one instance of, um, kind of racial injustice or kind of discrimination against these black players um, that that you know to Shanir's point we don't really hear about because it gets it gets suppressed in the name of the team right the mm -hmm. team is winning they're winning the Champions League why are you going to make all of this public on the flip side it, it, it becomes public in 96 right with with the Dutch national team in the Euros but uh, that may be further down the conversation but yeah so there's, so there's a lot going on in the Netherlands um, and I think it's just a kind of looking at the specificity of the Netherlands, right? This, this kind of Surinamese connection, the multicultural bit in the Netherlands, um, but also the players being very vocal and public and passionate about their dual, uh, their dual identities or their dual nationalities. And I mean, to, to your point as well, is like you kind of look at where this team went. And also, it kind of it's kind of weird to see where a lot of these guys went because it makes you realize like how great of a power Italy was at this time because mm -hmm. I think like what seven or eight guys went to Italy alone yeah, yeah. so he's not a Milan fan that's where, all, that's where everybody right. went next huh? <laughs> like right. seven or eight right. guys yep. went, yep. went, went, like, went to Italy I think two guys went to Barca and one guy went to Arsenal so it's like you kind of see where the influence of power was at that time just by looking at some of those transfer games mm -hmm. I mean this yeah. team Moving yeah. all, even constructed such a great team that they kind of almost run it back again in 95, you know, going with um, winning the um, Air Division and losing the Champions League final to Juve, who, funny enough, hasn't won a Champions League final since uh, 96, which is hilarious uh, as well, right? And looks like they're about to get relegated again to Serie B. Works for me. <laughs> going on there, man. Um, <laughs> I want to I want to pinpoint on this part. When we look at this team in history, how do you think the culture is going to resonate with this team? How, how do you think they're going to look at them? Their long lasting legacy and impact. I think um, they're going to look at them with with a lot of praise, right? Like they're going to remember this team. Uh, not just for their championship victory, but how they did it, right? And who they did it with, right? I mean, we've been talking this whole episode just about how black this team was. And I think that's, it's a it's a foundational point in this kind of black soccer history, particularly in the context of Europe, right? Like not only are they good, but they're outspoken, right? Like they're, they are outspoken, <laughs> like yeah. cussing out coaches and all of, like straight up cussing out coaches. And so um, I think people will remember them for exactly that. Not only how hard they played on the pitch and, 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 their, and their technicality, right? Um, their successes throughout Europe after Ajax, right? We can think of Seydorf and his, just, just 
long list of achievements, right? Uh, particularly in the Champions League. So it's, I think that's how they'll be remembered, it's just as, as winners, but also as as hella black winners. <laughs> I know you're, you're you're great at seeing the underlying layers of a team, just more so outside of what they come together as before the impact on and off the field. What do you like? What is the legacy of this IX team off the field? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think for me, as far as club teams go, I think they're just I don't say cultural reset, but they are hmm. like they are the culture, right? Like I look at players today, or even players between that time and now, and like the ability to like be yourself be unapologetically black whether you're certain these like how however that works right they had to navigate it a little bit differently but i think it it lays the groundwork again particularly in europe but i think across the board for black players in particular to not 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 assimilate but like to not close themselves off right to not to be able to play the sport in a way that's true to them, true to their culture, um, play it in a way that's free, um, and it still works in a team setting, right? Like, again, arguably one of the most dominant teams in a single year in Europe, um, and that you could play that way, and you could be yourself and still be successful, and that there, there's a multitude of ways to win at this sport, and I think they showed a very specific way right like embracing the culture of total football it's this very dutch way of playing but then them bringing their own cultures and their own personalities and perfecting it and the youthfulness too right like mm -hmm. they're proof that you can win with young players mm -hmm. um it's a risk <laughs> like i'm not saying everybody should build a young team but when done right and when you have all of these things line up it can be incredibly successful and like you said if this team doesn't break up if our camp doesn't leave early like a year before they win and all of this other stuff everything looks completely different but i think it's almost this kismet thing where you have this group of players the vast majority of them are a decent amount of them are black in europe at a time when that's not really happened from a from a league um where people don't normally win champions league right like you said at this time italy is very dominant right. um in, in european football and so um, and to do it domestically, right? To do it with quote unquote Dutch players, right? Players who are Dutch and something else. But I think it, it coalesces this national identity around you can be Dutch in a bunch of different ways. And one of them is to be a bunch of black dudes from, with different heritage, right? Who all ended up in this country and can play. And not everybody plays, right? Like, again, we did our last episode on Ernie Stewart, who could have easily played for the Netherlands, but plays, you know, for the rest. And, you know, you, you have these you know different people in that country but it it creates an identity and it creates a dutch footballing identity like i i, I like dutch football right and i think that weirds people out but then you mention ajax and things like that and you're like oh yeah that makes a lot of sense because they have mm -hmm. you know croif in their head or something like that and mm -hmm, i think mm -hmm. they've redefined like what that is and players after them generations after them can look and be like i want to play like that and i think particularly you know, just giving love to my midfielders, like, it, it showed a generation of kids, like, you can be a black midfielder, you can be a boss, mm -hmm. there's a million different ways to play in the midfield. Um, we mm -hmm. can do that, where I don't think that was always highlighted. So, um, I think that's sort of the legacy, it's just a culture, you can be yourself and be free and win, and play and, and be young, and matter to the sport, not just when you're playing it the long after. Right. So, I mean, honestly, I think that's a good way of how to lead this podcast off. I mean, what it all sounds like we all came together on is this is a team that culturally was a little bit ahead of ahead of its time to where the black culture, the black, the, the average black soccer fan wasn't around to really respect and honor them. But this is a team where it kind of like, if you want to look for the start date, this is it. This is the 94, 94, 95 IX team. It's kind of like the start of black soccer fans kind of like looking at the team and be like oh snap i can play midfield with other black people and win trophies mm -hmm. kind of cool mm -hmm. and kind of see how these guys done on and off the field in the course of their careers 
Um, so with that being said, with that, uh, listeners, we just want to say thank you for taking the time out of your day for listening to our show because without you, we couldn't do this show.